Good afternoon, everybody. I'd just like to say a warm welcome to my presentation and uh, thank you to uh, Michael Ryder and everyone at the Royal Society for Asian Affairs for the kind invitation to talk about my book, uh, Dr. Teacher Terrorist, The Life and Legacy of Al-Qaeda Leader Ayman al-Zawari. So my aim is to unpack the 55 years of terrorism that Ayman al-Zawari was involved in and hopefully demonstrate how important he has been when it comes to uh, global terrorism. So with that in mind, uh, we can begin. Often when we look at Al-Qaeda, we think about Osama bin Laden. He tends to be the center of Al-Qaeda. The research often is designed to reflect that. But actually, if you look at it, Ayman al-Zawari was always in the middle of many of Al-Qaeda's biggest plots and sometimes even leading them. Uh, and that, I think, has often been neglected in the past and one of the reasons why I wanted to write my book. And the other thing that I wanted to show were the different threads that connect Ayman al-Zawari with a whole plethora of senior terrorists, sometimes tied to Al-Qaeda core, sometimes to the affiliates. But Ayman al-Zawari was very much the thread that was uh, interconnected with so many of these individuals. Let's go back to where Ayman al-Zawari was from. He grew up in a very wealthy, prosperous suburb of Cairo called Ahmadi. And this is a place which had private sports clubs, uh, manicured lawns. Uh, it had a very strong foreign presence uh, as well. And this was seen as a very opulent part of Egypt's uh, capital. Ayman al-Zawari uh, himself grew up uh, in many ways, a lap of luxury. Uh, he had very prominent family members in politics, in ideology, uh, in religion, in uh, as doctors. So how did this uh, young boy grow up from being a potential successful doctor to becoming the right-hand man of Al-Qaeda to becoming the biggest, most wanted terrorist in the world? Let's go back to 2001, following the September 11th attacks and the Battle of uh, Tora Bora. Al-Qaeda is holed up here uh, in Afghanistan, and the US Operation Enduring Freedom is being conducted. It is here where Ayman al-Zawari writes the book, his supposed to be his last will and testament, known as the Knights Under the Prophet's Banner. And in it, Ayman al-Zawari talks about history. He actually was somebody who was very interested in history and studied the archival research that was available. He spoke about colonial rule how France, Britain, Ottoman forces had fought over Egypt, imposed foreign rulers, and then tried to control Egypt's economy, such as through the Suez Canal. He then also talks about the various failed nationalist attempts to remove British rule inside uh, Egypt, how Britain used various different mechanisms to impose its control, such as the veiled protectorate. So this was something that al-Zawari was very keen to demonstrate, that colonialism within the global South was one of his grievances. He also looked at World War I and how Britain found itself at the opposite side of the uh, Ottoman uh, Empire and the fact that they had fought various battles. Tied to this was, again, what al-Zawari would complain about, which was the imposition of rulers upon Egyptian society, such as Hussein Kamal replacing uh, Abbas II. Within all of this, you have the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which was an agreement by two bureaucrats, one French, one British, that had discussed about how they would carve up the Ottoman Empire once the war uh, would end. And that was under the assumption that Britain and France and eventually the United States would be successful. So this was something that al-Zawari saw as a huge grievance and humiliation upon the Islamic world with the ending of one of the most important Islamic caliphates. Again, Ayman al-Zawari would, would focus on how nationalism would not aid Egypt, such as the Egyptian revolution led by uh, Saad Zagul. This was an illustration of al-Zawari that nationalism is not enough to create effective change. So even though the British in 1922 uh, did a unilateral declaration of Egyptian independence for al-Zawari, this was still British control that was shaping 
uh, Egyptian identity. In 1928, we saw religion becoming an important component in Egypt's affairs with uh, Hassan al-Banna founding the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, creating a movement that would directly challenge British rule as well as the ruling regime inside Egypt itself. Al-Zawari was not necessarily a fan of al-Banna because he felt that al-Banna was willing to compromise with the state. In this time frame also, I think it's significant to talk about Ayman al-Zawari's own family ties. So one of his great uncles on his father's side, Muhammad al-Zawahiri, was the grand imam of al-Azhar, one of the most prestigious Islamic seminaries in the world. He was eventually removed from that position because of his opposition to British colonial rule. And this became a massive source of anger and frustration for al-Zawahiri. Another example of, a, uh, this time, a relative from the maternal side was Abdul Rahman Azam, who was the very first Arab League Secretary General. And he assumed that position during a very turbulent time because you saw the creation of the state of Israel. You saw Arab forces being defeated by Israel itself. So Ayman al-Zawari carried that dynamic within his family. In this time frame, you also had another very prominent Egyptian ideologue, the teacher Said Qutb, who attained notoriety because he had traveled to the United States in 1948 and 1949 to understand teaching methods. And he uh, gave a first-hand account of America in his own biased interpretation, being very critical about what he saw Western moral decay, whether it was in New York or in Greeley, Colorado. Eventually, you would see the rise of Gamal Abdel Nasser of the Free Officers Movement. And he worked briefly with Said Qutb, but they fell out because Qutb felt that religion needed to play an important role, whereas uh, uh, Nasser believed in secular nationalism. It was here that, I'll just go back a second, it was here that uh, Qutb wrote uh, the most important treatise for many jihadists, which is Milestones. It spoke about removing leaders in Islamic worlds that they deemed to be uh, apostate and use violence. He was imprisoned for that and eventually sentenced to death. His lawyer, Mahfuz Azam, was one of the relatives of Ayman al-Zawari. And that story of him representing Said Qutb impacted on Ayman al-Zawari very significantly. He saw himself in many ways carrying the legacy of uh, Said Qutb. Many years later, in 1974, uh, Ayman al-Zawari, who had just finished uh, graduating as a, as a doctor, hopefully going down that path, decided that he was going to carry out a, an assault on the military technical college uh, in, in Egypt, which was led by other individuals too. That was disrupted by the authorities, and al-Zawari managed to be let off because of his family ties, but the other co-conspirators were convicted. Around this time, we also saw the rise of Anwar Sadat as president of Egypt. He changed Egypt's policies. He moved them more closer to America and became the first Egyptian president to recognize uh, Israel, as well as the first Arab leader to formalize relations with Israel as well. The other thing that Sadat did was he began to release a lot of the jihadists and Islamists that had been imprisoned by Nasser. He tried to profess that he too had religious credentials. But this was during a very challenging economic time for Egypt internally. And what happened was is that many of those Islamists that were released became influential within the college campuses and began to shape the direction. Eventually, a book that was written by an Egyptian ideologue, Muhammad Abdel Salam Faraj, The Neglected Duty, was very provocative because it painted uh, Sadat as a pharaoh, as a pre-Islamic ruler. And it, like uh, Milestones, it also advocated killing rulers that were deemed to be un-Islamic. Uh, and this was where the ill-fated incident of the uh, Anwar Sadat assassination then began on October 6th, 1981, in which the Al-Jihad terrorist group assassinated Anwar Sadat at a military parade with his deputy and then eventual successor, Hosni Mubarak, also uh, and in attendance. Ayman al-Zawari was on the periphery of the plot. He was not necessarily directing it, but he was part of the al-Jihad entity. And this is where he made his name, because during the Sadat trial, uh, Ayman al-Zawari became the voice, he became the face for the al-Jihad terrorist group. He spoke with fiery rhetoric. He spoke in English often too. 
And with the world's media focused on the prison cells, Ayman al-Zawari gained a lot of attention and maximum publicity. And a lot of the pr other prisoners hung on every word and then would chant when he would finish his edict. It was also here where we see Ayman al-Zawari using the single uh, index finger, which was meant to convey oneness with God, uh, his piety. And many jihadists later in decades to come would also use that index finger. But al-Zawari was the very first to do it in front of the media in order to demonstrate his own religiosity. Whilst all these individuals in al-Jihad al were imprisoned, there was an internal fracture that occurred, and the group split in two. Ayman al-Zawari would eventually lead what would become Egyptian Islamic Jihad, EIJ, and his rival, Omar Abdul Rahman, would become the leader of the al gama al Islamia terrorist group. And they would both fight over soldiers, ideology, and resources. One, al-Zawari was released from prison in 1984 because they couldn't convict him for the assassination of Anwar Sadat. He, like many Egyptian Islamists, were then encouraged to leave Egypt, and he went to Afghanistan uh, and Pakistan when the Soviets had invaded uh, uh, Afghanistan. This is where opportunity came for Ayman al-Zawari, uh, and where he happened to be coming into the presence of one Osama bin Laden. At this time, bin Laden uh, was working with a Jordanian-Palestinian ideologue, Abdullah Azam, uh, who was very close to a Tajik Afghan fighter, Mujahideen fighter, Ahmed Shah Massoud. Ayman al-Zawari made sure that he developed close ties with Osama bin Laden. Not only that, but he made sure that bin Laden became his key ally, supporter, financer. Uh, and this was also around the time that Abdullah Azam was isolated. Uh, he eventually died under very mysterious circumstances. Um, and in my book, I go into um, detail as to who potentially was responsible for, for killing him. Following the Soviets being defeated in Afghanistan, under the uh, influence of Ayman al-Zawari, the uh, bin Laden and his followers also began to focus on what was called the uh, strategy uh, against the internal enemy, specifically against rulers within the Islamic world. And for al-Zawari, what was so important was targeting Hosni Mubarak. Various operations were conducted to try and assassinate uh, Hosni Mubarak, including a uh, mass casualty operation against Mubarak when he was in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where two dozen suicide bombers were unleashed on uh, Mubarak's uh, uh, um, uh, vehicles that had just arrived uh, from, from Egypt into Ethiopia. Um, it just demonstrated how desperate and keen al-Zawari was to try and wipe out the Egyptian uh, pr president. There were also plots abroad uh, against Egyptian assets, such as the Egyptian embassy bombing in Pakistan in 1995, a massive uh, suicide uh, vehicle born improvised explosive device uh, killed many people as a result of that. So this was the war that al-Zawari wanted to unleash. In 1997, al-Zawari also wanted to spread the mission and the campaign. He was trying to go into Chechnya. He ended up being arrested in the other neighboring Russian province of Dagestan. The Russian authorities didn't know who he was, uh, but they were angry that he came in without the, the correct papers. Spent time in prison and eventually was released after the Russian prison guards were bribed. Little did they know who they had released. A year later, Ayman al-Zawari uh, formally became part of Osama bin Laden's uh, 1998 fatwa and declaration against uh, the West. Uh, which culminated in terrorist attacks, such as the 1998 U.S. embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania, and then subsequently after that, the bombing of the USS Cole in uh, Yemen. Ayman al-Zawari also worked in tandem with Osama bin Laden, and together they created many training camps for al-Qaeda, including uh, building safe houses and places where they could train, prepare, plot their activities. And this was under the blessing of the Taliban. So Al-Qaeda and Egyptian Islamic Jihad worked together in tandem with their uh, agenda to 
plot and plan attacks against the internal enemy within the Islamic world, as well as targeting the West in the global South. Another aspect that uh, was relevant, which I discussed in my book also, was Ayman al-Zawari's obsession in creating biological, chemical, radiological, and nuclear weapons. Uh, he was not successful, thankfully, partly because that was disrupted by uh, the 9-11 attacks. But Ayman al-Zawari was very, very keen to try and develop those tools to inflict maximum damage. We also saw the alignment of Al-Qaeda and Egyptian Islamic Jihad in the summer of 2001. And this was where Ayman al-Zawari had to face a dilemma because Osama bin Laden became convinced that the U.S. was weak and needed to be attacked directly, that no longer should there just be attacks against U.S. interests in the global south, but there should be attacks also on the U.S. mainland as well. Ayman al-Zawari faced that dilemma because within his own Egyptian Islamic Jihad, he, there was opposition to that. Many did not want to escalate the war in the United States. Ultimately, out of a sense of loyalty, kinship, and the fact that they had collaborated so well, the fact that bin Laden chose Ayman al-Zawari over Abdullah Azam, al-Zawari sided with bin Laden that the 9-11 attacks had to go ahead. And he also consolidated the relationship by merging EIJ with al-Qaeda. The worry was that this would potentially result in U.S. counterterrorism operations in Afghanistan if uh, al-Qaeda carried out the attack. And many within the uh, Egyptian Islamic Jihad were opposed, not just to 9-11, not because they had any love for America. They didn't. They were fine with carrying out attacks against U.S. interests in Africa and Asia, but they just didn't want to have the spotlight on them. So one incident, which I talk in detail in my book, which doesn't get a lot of attention, but it is as important as the 9-11 attacks, is the assassination of Ahmed Shah Massoud, the ally of Abdullah Azam, the leader of what had become the Northern Alliance, which was a faction of different entities opposed to the Taliban rule. And Ahmed Shah Massoud was very much a thorn in the side of the Taliban. Uh, he had prevented them from taking over Afghanistan completely. Uh, he was seen as a rival to the Taliban in Afghanistan and also a rival to Al-Qaeda. So the theory that Al-Qaeda adopted was that if they target the U.S., the U.S. will need an ally on the ground in Afghanistan, and they will turn to Ahmed Shah Massoud. But if Ahmed Shah Massoud is assassinated, the Northern Alliance will divide. They won't be able to stay united. Uh, and then the U.S. will not have any ground ally in the aftermath of an operation on the U.S. itself. So Ayman al-Zawari was tasked with a very intricate and detailed operation to assassinate uh, Ahmed Shah Massoud. And they planned it well over a year in advance. And there was a ruse where it was created the scenario that two individuals, ostensibly from a Belgian television uh, news station, would interview Ahmed Shah Massoud. And that dialogue began a year before 9-11. Eventually, those two people would travel to Afghanistan, and they had all the camera kit and, and, uh, and all the technology for the interview, so suspicions were not there by either Ahmed Shah Massoud or his security detail. What no one knew was that there was a bomb hidden within one of the cameras. And then when uh, Ahmed Shah Massoud sat down for the interview, the camera exploded, killing him and one of the Al-Qaeda terrorists. Had this operation not been conducted, I would argue that 9-11 would have been harder to pull off. But with Ahmed Shah Massoud out of the way, thanks to Ayman al-Zawari's uh, own plotting uh, and, 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 and conniving, this now opened all doors for what we would see subsequently, which was one of the most devastating terrorist attacks uh, in history. And 9-11 had a huge impact on everyone's life, um, political, economic, social, but it could not have happened without Ayman al-Zawari's successful assassination of uh, Ahmed Shah Massoud. So then if we go back to where I started in my presentation, the Battle of uh, Tora Bora, Ayman al-Zawari 
had thought that his time was up, that the U.S. were going to eventually kill him and Osama bin Laden. And there were massive efforts to try and find them. You can see here an individual holding a small leaflet, uh, wanting to find where the al-Qaeda leadership was. They actually had been done uh, a massive favor uh, with uh, support from various entities in Pakistan that took them over the border from Afghanistan into Pakistan. The entities uh, that had opposed the 9-11 attacks, some of them went into Iran, as well as other family members of the al-Qaeda leadership. The aim was that they wouldn't all travel together as a very large cluster to avoid being detected. The U.S. turned to people like General Pervez Musharraf of Pakistan, the military ruler, to try and round up al-Qaeda. But the problem was that the general held very murky uh, ties with the terrorists themselves. Uh, and he proved to be a very unreliable ally. Despite all the debt write-off economic support that the U.S. gave, uh, the Pakistani military played a double game. And they were ably assisted by various Taliban factions that harbored al-Qaeda, protected them, shielded them in Pakistan, including the notorious Haqqani network, which today are actually the most powerful Taliban faction in Afghanistan. There were also other entities such as Hafi Said of the Lashkari Toiba and Malana Masood Azhar of the Jaishi Muhammad. These are two Pakistani jihadist groups that are affiliated to al-Qaeda, and they had carried out various terrorist attacks in India subsequently, such as the attack on the Indian parliament in December 2001 or the Mumbai siege attacks in 2008. And they were very much the beneficiaries of the relationship with al-Qaeda. So one thing just to talk about was that Ayman al-Zawari became the, one of the world's most wanted terrorists alongside Osama bin Laden. And you can see here the uh, most wanted poster by the United States. And they also... Uh, had produced other leaflets, um, such as the U.S. State Department's Rewards for Justice program in multiple languages, whether it was in Pashto, in Persian, uh, or in Arabic. And if you look at the uh, most wanted uh, poster on the on the left, this is actually where I got the idea for the title um, of my book. So in the uh, aliases column, you can see doctor and teacher. And then, of course, on the top, most wanted terrorists. So Dr. Teacher Terrorist became the title. And it was also very much a reflection of Ayman al-Zawari's own credentials, being a doctor, being a teacher, and of course, being a terrorist as well. Within all of this, there was another very important aspect of Ayman al-Zawari's life, and that was technology. You are looking at a person who grew up in an age where technology was slow, and Ayman al-Zawari from the 1970s onward, began to see the importance of how technology can be used to become the oxygen of publicity for al-Qaeda. He had relatives that worked as stringers for the US media in Egypt. And through them, he got fascinated with the editorial standards of a news broadcast, of how it's done, of how it's edited, how it's produced, the cutaways, the different angles that would be done. And with technology evolving, Ayman al-Zawari himself began to utilize it for terrorist purposes. It might seem outdated now, but he was the very first uh, jihadist to use the fax machine to convey messages of responsibility for attacks. He also began to utilize the internet. Al-Qaeda created a Sahab media company, which was their own company to produce propaganda videos. In December 2001, Ayman al-Zawari spoke about the need for al-Qaeda and the jihadist movement to break the media siege. They wanted to be independent from relying on other media companies to carry their message. They wanted to control it. And with the advent of the internet, al-Qaeda was able to produce its own content without being at the mercy of anybody else. And this was very much down to Ayman al-Zawari, which I go into detail about in my book. Within all of this, we see Al-Qaeda wanting to plot and plan large-scale attacks. Many of the plots were disrupted thanks to British counterterrorism agencies, along with their partnership with Five Eyes countries like the United States. Unfortunately, some did uh, succeed, some of those attacks, including the 7-7 bombings. And you see here, again, Ayman al-Zawari using the media for his own purpose to claim responsibility, along with one of the pre-recorded videos by 
the, the British suicide bomber Shehzad uh, Tanweer. That was believed to have been recorded in Pakistan. Another pl uh, plot, which doesn't get a lot of attention, but it's actually one that's had maybe the biggest impact on our lives, is what was called Operation Overt, often also known as the liquid bomb plot, where you had several individuals uh, from the UK, some of Pakistani heritage, who had been trained in Pakistan by Al-Qaeda, and their goal was to hijack several transatlantic flights from the UK and blow them up across the Atlantic Ocean over uh, a, a sequential period using liquid explosives. Thankfully, British authorities and their American uh, counterparts were able to thwart this, arrest those individuals, and prosecute them. But the plot uh, could have had massive ramifications in terms of the death toll. It could have rivaled 9-11 if it had been successful. And even though it didn't succeed, it has created massive disruption to this day. The uh, plot resulted in the liquid ban that still exists at most airports, where you have to bring those plastic bags with you on board the flight if you are carrying uh, not, uh, 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 hand baggage. Also, within the 100 meter bottle, 100 mil bottles, I mean. So, very consequential plot, even though it didn't kill anybody, it has caused a massive amount of disruption and headache to our lives. The other aspect is uh, the training that would go on in Pakistan. So a lot of the plots in the UK, like the airline liquid bomb plot, the 7-7 bombings, and others, a lot of the individuals uh, would be trained in Pakistan, where this again demonstrated the very murky nature of how Al-Qaeda was cooperating with local Pakistani jihadist groups, who in turn had very strong ties with the Pakistani military. The U.S. was getting very concerned about Ayman al-Zawari's role um, in uh, post 9-11, and there were various attempts to try and assassinate him or carry out drone operations uh, against him, airstrikes. They all were failing because Ayman al-Zawari had developed a very close nexus with these different entities, and they were protecting him. And very much often he would get notice at the last minute of an impending U.S. operation, and he would escape. One other thing I discuss also in my book are the rivalries that Ayman al-Zawari had with other jihadists, such as uh, Abu Musab al-Zakawi, the former leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq, and the differences of opinion that they had over the al-Qaeda strategy, with al-Zakawi wanting to carry out sectarian attacks inside Iraq, and Ayman al-Zawari being opposed to it. It also demonstrates the differences of opinion that al-Zawari had with bin Laden over the direction of al-Qaeda. One other plot, which doesn't get a lot of attention in connection to Ayman al-Zawari, but through my own research, I was able to look at the fact that Ayman al-Zawari was a factor in the assassination of the former Pakistani Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, uh, who had returned to Pakistan in the hope to become its Prime Minister for a third time. Ayman al-Zawari was also very cunning and able to turn the tables on his foes. One of the case studies I look at in the book is of the Jordanian Human al-Balawi, who Jordanian authorities and also the Americans thought they had managed to turn him into a double agent as he had previously been connected to al-Qaeda. And the goal was to send him to Pakistan to locate Osama bin Laden, who was believed to be in the tribal areas of Pakistan. Sorry, to locate Ayman al-Zawari, who was in the tribal areas of, of Pakistan. What they didn't realize was that Human al-Balawi had been turned into a triple agent. Ayman al-Zawari flipped him and turned him around so that he would be an asset for al-Qaeda. And when Human al-Balawi had uh, arranged a meeting in coast Afghanistan with his American and Jordanian uh, handlers under the premise that he had intelligence about Ayman al-Zawari, he then detonated a suicide uh, bomb, uh, killing those individuals. It was a devastating a terrorist attack, and once again illustrating Ayman al-Zawari being two steps ahead uh, of the people that are trying to, to, to capture him. In 2011, the U.S. were able to get Osama bin Laden with Operation Neptune Spear, where he was located in Abbottabad, Pakistan, right next to, interestingly enough, the Pakistani military uh, academy. It was here that Ayman al-Zawari came into his own. He became the leader of Al-Qaeda, and that was supported by Al-Qaeda's uh, affiliates.
It's interesting that if you look at where all the Al-Qaeda leadership was getting picked up and arrested, they were all in the urban centers of Pakistan, uh, where perhaps it was easier for the U.S. to locate, even though it may have taken some time in the case of bin Laden, whereas Ayman al-Zawari preferred to stay in the tribal areas uh, of, uh, of Pakistan, where he felt he was insulated, protected by the Taliban and other groups. In 2011, we also saw the Egyptian revolution as a result of the Arab Spring. Hosni Mubarak was removed from power, and perhaps with a rich sense of irony in his trial in a similar type of prison cell that he had put Ayman al-Zawari in uh, o- over two decades prior. During the 12th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, Ayman al-Zawari had issued a message to followers around the world to carry out lone actor operations. And this was in a form of reprisal for the fact that one of his deputies, Abu Yahya Libby, had been killed in a US-led operation. And what we saw was uh, a massive protest that went out of control outside the US embassy in Cairo, where these protesters stormed the uh, US compound, led by Ayman al-Zawari's brother, uh, Mohammed. You also saw a flag that would become very relevant in later years, this flag that's appearing on the screen. And it looks like an ISIS flag, but it's important to point out this was before ISIS was created. Uh, And I think that's where Al-Qaeda had a problem because they didn't necessarily take ownership of the flag. There was also the uh, subsequent incident at the U.S. consulate in Benghazi, Libya, where the U.S. ambassador and several uh, U.S. military personnel were killed. So even though Ayman al-Zawari was not able to plot large-scale attacks, they were able to cause maximum impact and damage. Around this time, as a result of bin Laden no longer being there, Ayman al-Zawari fulfilled one of his goals, which was to increase al-Qaeda's membership and affiliation. So the al-Shabaab terrorist group, which wanted to be an affiliate of al-Qaeda, but bin Laden kept rejecting, was now finally admitted within the al-Qaeda fraternity under Ayman al-Zawari. So this was another difference that he had with uh, bin Laden, which I also talk about in, in my book. We also saw the Arab Spring impacting on Iraq and Syria, uh, and two separate issues of a civil war in Syria against uh, the rule of the Assad regime, and then the sectarian politics that were being uh, influencing uh, society in Iraq. Both of these began to converge. We also uh, saw another fracture within the jihadist movement, where Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who would become the leader of ISIS, fought with Abu Muhammad al-Jalani, who was seen to be loyal to al-Qaeda. In my book, I talk about the fact that Ayman al-Zawari made strategic mistakes. And one of them was his inability to resolve the tension between al-Baghdadi and uh, al-Jalani. Eventually, al-Baghdadi separated from al-Qaeda, formed ISIS, and even declared himself as the leader of the caliphate when ISIS began to grow and expand, and where they actually began to supersede al-Qaeda with recruits from abroad and becoming a very powerful entity, including carrying out attacks in France and Belgium. But as much as ISIS grew quickly, they also courted attention from the West, and they began to shrink. Ayman al-Zawari faced other challenges too, including various drone operations on senior al-Qaeda leaders, as well as affiliates. And they began to lose a lot of the support and the the, uh, infrastructure that they once had. So the challenge that bin Laden uh, uh, had once faced was now solely Ayman al-Zawari's. And that was that the senior leadership of al-Qaeda were getting captured, killed, and picked off, including, of course, Osama bin Laden. And eventually Ayman al-Zawari was left with what I call an Egyptian rum, him and Saif al-Adl, his his deputy. But Ayman al-Zawari wasn't all that keen in pushing the goal and the agenda Uh, of carrying out mass casualty attacks. Instead, he focused on what was called the safe basis strategy. And that was Al-Qaeda was more than happy to let ISIS take all the limelight and the focus in US-led counterterrorism operations. Al-Qaeda needed instead to rebuild quietly, to grow, to not attract any attention. So part of the safe basis strategy was that Al-Zawari spoke about recruiting and mobilizing to end up being an entity that it could be able to start plotting and planning attacks, but they had to start again. And they had to start without being encumbered by 
uh, US-led operations. He also encouraged Al-Qaeda followers, affiliates to create their own funding streams. So they're financially independent and not dependent on any other entity. Local outreach was very important. So Ayman al-Zawari would talk about marrying into local communities, winning their support, using them as a buffer to insulate them from potential counterterrorism operations. This was something that was very important, and al-Qaeda did that in Afghanistan and Pakistan by marrying into the families of the Taliban, who in turn would show their loyalty to them and protect them. Another aspect was to create a structured cadre's system within al-Qaeda and its affiliates. So whether this would be al-Qaeda core, al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, or al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, that all were tasked with the purposes of having a system top-down, organized, regimented. And the other aspect was that if they were going to do attacks, focus on the internal enemy again, meaning regimes within the global south, within the Islamic world itself, that al-Qaeda was not strong enough to start plotting global attacks. And if they did, they would end up facing the brunt of, of the US. So ben, uh, Ayman al-Zawari's focus was very much bide your time, grow quietly, don't court uh, any notoriety, and eventually you'll be in a position to once again plot and plan attacks as you see fit. Much of this then coincided with the Taliban reconquering Afghanistan. And with that, us uh, people like Ayman al-Zawari were brought back into Afghanistan under the protection of, uh, of, of the Taliban itself. This was where um, Ayman al-Zawari was then housed in the embassy district of, uh, of Kabul, uh, Shapur, which was where a lot of the opulent buildings were created, uh, where uh, a lot of the ill-gotten money from Afghanistan from 2001 to 2020 was often uh, put. And if you look at the house in which Ayman al-Zawari was put in, it was a very uh, palatial one uh, and uh, was multi-storied. And you can see in the image that this was where the US eventually found and tracked Ayman al-Zawari and where they targeted him in, in a drone operation. Just to kind of demonstrate to you how important and significant that was. So Ayman al-Zawari, if you go into Google map, you can actually type into Google map Ayman al-Zawari's residence, and it will show you uh, where he, he he his residence was in Shepur district, which happens to be right uh, near the U.S. embassy, as well as the British, Indonesian, Canadian, uh, German, French embassies, the, the Chinese embassy as well. Also, a very short distance to uh, the what was once the Ministry of Women's Affairs, but under the Taliban, they shut it down and made it the Taliban's Ministry of Vice and Virtue, whose sole purpose it is to subjugate uh, the rights of women. It's also very close to uh, the Taliban's uh, General Directorate of Intelligence, the GDI, which is basically the Taliban Intelligence Agency. So you can see how close the Taliban kept Ayman al-Zawari to them. They knew, they knew he was there and they'd brought him back and they thought that they had enough to protect him. But the U.S. was able to use what remained of its uh, intelligence assets in Afghanistan to be able to carry out this very sophisticated drone operation. And I talk about that in my book in great detail. So Al-Qaeda's structure um, in, in 2023 uh, resulted in major changes with, us, with uh, Ayman al-Zawari having been killed. No one was necessarily announced as his successor, although many believe that Saif al-Adil in, in Iran is, is the leader. But regardless of whether he is or not, al-Qaeda remains an entity that's bonded by a common cause and ideology and very much following Ayman al-Zawari's safe basis strategy, whether it's Saif al-Adil in Iran, AQAP, AQIM, AQIS, Hura Saldin in Syria, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, all these entities are following through on what Ayman al-Zawari wanted. One thing we've also seen in the current crisis in the Middle East, especially between Israel and, and Hamas, has been a revival of Al-Qaeda by a young generation, the Gen Z generation, that have begun to look at Al-Qaeda in a, in a different light. Um, and 
in particular, the uh, Letter to America, as it was called, which had been written ostensibly by Osama bin Laden in 2002, a year after 9-11, got a lot of attention on TikTok. And a lot of the um, Gen Z population were discussing it. They were looking at it. And some of them felt that maybe Al-Qaeda had a point when it came to Palestine. It was very worrying and concerning because when you just take a snippet of a comment and you don't necessarily see the full context of it, what it means, what its connotations are, it becomes a challenge. And it became more problematic when newspapers began to remove the letter because they'd previously put it up on their website, fueling conspiracy theories and claims of government censorship. And the document can still be found uh, online in any case. One of the ironies here is that actually Osama bin Laden was, may not have been the author of that letter. It was uh, arguably Ayman al-Zawari because it was included in a collection of letters and documents in one of Ayman al-Zawari's 2007 uh, books that was published um, online uh, by al-Qaeda itself. So it kind of demonstrates the challenge about nuance uh, and the full context as to what al-Qaeda is. Maybe one of the challenges is that this young generation, they didn't witness the September 11th attacks. So they don't have that lived in history, either of 9-11 or even the attacks that preceded 9-11, such as the U.S. embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania, or the attacks after, such as the 7-7 attack. A lot of them grew up with that skepticism and pessimism, following the stories of the 2003 war in Iraq, led by Prime Minister Tony Blair of the UK and President Bush of the United States, and the perception that this had actually damaged counterterrorism credibility because of the claims that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and that Al-Qaeda was there. So it's an important reminder that dialogue is significant and to have that discussion and remind a young generation what Al-Qaeda was about, the evils that it had, the plotting that it did, and the targeting of innocent civilians that it primarily focused on, and that it is dangerous to just focus on one or two lines that may sound reasonable, but in the wider context, when you look at the full picture, demonstrate a very dangerous ideological terrorist group. And if Al-Qaeda is going through a retro moment where it has been revised and there is a sense of revisionism, I think there that is a real challenge for counterterrorism agencies. I had actually written an article for Foreign Policy magazine um, on this on this very issue here. Speaking about retro. In many ways, um, as, as Mark Twain said, that history doesn't uh, repeat itself, it rhymes. And we are seeing that rhyme taking place. Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, uh, who was appointed as the military uh, head in Egypt by uh, Mohamed Morsi, is the one now in power inside Egypt. He removed uh, Morsi in a military coup in 2013. The Al-Qaeda support for the Taliban also continues to endure. The Taliban leadership that has taken over Afghanistan are a mixture of old faces like Hibatullah Akhazanda, who was one of the co-founders of the Taliban. He is the supreme leader. You've got Mullah Omar's son, Mullah Yaqub, as the defense minister. You've also got Siraj Din Haqqani, who is the interior minister of the Taliban regime. And his father was Siraj Din Haqqani, a very close ally of Al-Qaeda's leaders, as is Siraj Din Haqqani, who is accused of actually bringing Ayman al-Zawari back into Afghanistan. So Taliban 2.0 arguably could well be Taliban 1.0 of the 1990s. And many of these Taliban figures are actually holding uh, cabinet positions, even though they're also sanctioned by the United Nations. And as al-Qaeda has pledged an oath of allegiance to the Taliban, the Taliban are obligated to protect them. Another example of uh, things going back to the way they were, Al-Qaeda is assembling in various parts of Afghanistan in similar provinces that they had uh, once before. And even though the infrastructure may not be at the level it was in the 1990s, it is slowly rebuilding where Al-Qaeda leaders are being housed, safe houses are being provided, and even training camps. These are not the training camps that were the ones we saw in the 1990s. They're much smaller in scale, often there are schools that have been closed down by the Taliban, schools that may have allowed co-education or for girls. 
and they've been turned over for Al Qaeda to to utilize. There's also Al Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, very much a creation of Ayman al Zawari that acts as a further buffer to insulate Al Qaeda, and it's made up predominantly of people from Pakistan and Afghanistan. So Al Qaeda is showing those worrying signs of having a presence in Afghanistan. That doesn't mean they're going to go global anytime soon, but it does mean that incubation process has begun. Something just to think about um, is the fact that in Afghanistan, another dimension that is repeating itself is that women have no rights inside the country. Their rights have been taken away. Uh, and they are now living in a very dark dystopian world that has uh, been inflicted upon them. And the worry that I have is that when you see misogyny rise in any uh, part of the world, you will see terrorism also grow because terrorism feeds off misogyny. So this is uh, my presentation. I hope it's been of interest. Um, this is the, the, the cover of my book. Um, I'm very fortunate that I've had some very illustrious people provide uh, uh, some, some acknowledgements for the back of the book. Lawrence Wright, who wrote The Looming Tower, uh, one of the um, great journalists looking at transnational terrorism. You've also got Bruce Rydell, who um, has been an advisor to several US presidents, one of the most knowledgeable people on terrorism on the Middle East and on South Asia. Tim Marshall, who's written books like The Prisoners of Geography, a very experienced practitioner who understands the geopolitics of the world, and two uh, esteemed academics, um, Alex Schmidt and James Forrest. Um, all of them have provided a different perspective of, of my book and how they looked at it. And in many ways, it has been very um, uh, heartwarming and touching and humbling to see how much value they've put um, into, into what I've uh, written. So I'm very grateful um, to them. And Dr. Teacher Terrorist is available in the UK in uh, December 2023. Um, on Amazon, on Oxford University Press's website, and and all um, other retailers. So I hope uh, you'll find it an interesting read. Uh, I would welcome uh, your your feedback, and I'll just leave my email there on the top of the screen. And you're you're very welcome to to get in touch with me. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you again to Michael and the RSAA for the kind invitation. And um, with that, I will uh, conclude.